everybody from San Francisco. Good afternoon to Austria. Uh, my name is Dan Zawaczynski. I'm the Austrian Trade Commissioner here in San Francisco and co-director of Open Austria. And I would like to welcome all of you to our first webinar of the Digital Imperative series in 2022. This is our second webinar in total in partnership with Salesforce. And before we dive right into the topic, I'll just give you a brief overview of who we are, what we do, and what the Digital Imperative series is all about. So Open Austria is actually a joint initiative between the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber and the Federal Austrian Ministry for European and International Affairs, as well as the Austrian Business Agency. So we are, or our mandate and our mission here in the Bay Area really is to connect the Austrian and the Bay Area ecosystems on, on a variety of levels, being it entrepreneurs, startups, investors, companies, researchers, artists, we try to cover all the level and just strengthen the, strengthen the cooperations between our, our two areas and our regions. We, this is also, this, this webinar is also part of the initiative of the Federal uh, Ministry for European International Affairs and the Chamber of Commerce, the so-called Refocus Austria Initiative that started during last year's time when it, with the goal to position or reposition Austria in, in the, or get Austria into the focus of, of, of foreign markets and in, foreign, in other countries to, um, to bring the attention to the strengths of our economy and, our, and, and the country itself. Why digital imperative? The assumption is that digitization is here is here to stay. It is. It is. It is. It is an imperative. It is an, it is unavoidable? And I think something that the last two years have really shown is that a lot of companies and a lot of industries were completely transformed. Our whole society was completely transformed out of pressure and necessity, obviously. But it is very obvious that digitization is now an an absolutely unavoidable move and move forward. Um, today we are not completely focusing on digitization, we are focusing actually on sustainability, another extremely important topic that was in the media and in, in all of our minds probably for the past couple of months and years. And we, we came up with the, uh, with the topic, the future is always greener on the other side, uh, considering that there's always things to learn from, an, from, from one another, there's always things that we can, uh, there's always best practices we can uh, we can uh, look in, in for, for, for advice from what, one another. And this time we try also to look to the Silicon Valley, to the Bay Area, but also, uh, you know, help the, the, our contacts and our community from the Bay Area to look towards Austria. That also has a really strong, uh, stre a big strength in the green tech and sustainability sector. I would like to, with this, I would like to introduce our three speakers and panelists today. That I'm very happy that they had the time to be with us today. So we have Miss Elfi Moare. She's the head of the Department for International Climate, Environment and Energy Affairs in the Austrian Ministry for Climate Action. She's been with the ministry for 20 years and what's amazing she's been also very strongly involved in the COP26 and she's with us today uh, to give us a recap the most important findings and uh, a, a way forward a little bit. And then we have two other perspectives more from the corporate side. We have with us also Julie Muret from Salesforce, originally a, from here, from the Bay Area, from Berkeley, California, but now calling London her home. And she's been with Salesforce since 2016 as a member of the sustainability team. And uh, she's gonna give us a very interesting perspective how a extremely fast and dynamic uh, company like Salesforce put so much effort into being sustainable, having a carbon neutral footprint. And last but not least, we have Reinhard Fuchs, he is co-founder of Glacier, an impact-driven startup whose mission, on the other hand, is to help other companies and organizations transform and become more greener, or as they say, bring uh, sustainability into the, the DNA of the companies. Welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for being with us. And as a, to just really give a bit of an atmospheric overview, I'd like to give you, Elfie, the stage to give us your impulse statement on, on the COP26. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the introduction and especially for the invitation uh, to be part of uh, this webinar today and uh, part of your, your series. 
Um, as you has, have already mentioned, uh, I'm happy to give an overview uh, of the last UN climate conference, uh, which uh, took place in November last year. And um, if we look now into the current pandemic situation here in Europe, and, and also uh, in the United States. Um, it's it's quite, quite amazing that we had uh, the possibility to meet physically uh, in November uh, in Glasgow. Uh, and it was the largest UN conference, uh, climate conference ever with more than 40,000 participants. Um, what I, what I um, the issues I would like to, to tackle in my uh, my introductory remarks um, are first of all uh, to give you a bit of a background what actually is the role of, Uni of a United uh, Climate uh, Conference um, because there are so many high expectations each and every time a COP is taking place um, but I, I think it would be good to uh, to have a clearer idea what can a UN uh, climate conference actually do and what uh, should not be expected from a UN meeting. Then um, I will also give you an overview of uh, the expectations we had for COP26 and then the actual outcomes uh, and, uh, and also um, provide some ideas from my side on what is needed uh, on climate action to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement and then uh, very briefly go to the question, what comes next? So what is, uh, what are the next steps then uh, going from Glasgow to Egypt? Um, so what is the role of a United Nations uh, climate conference? So um, you all know uh, and have heard about the Paris Agreement, the UN Climate Convention and the UN Climate Process. Um, this is um, our, or our very usual or very formal UN conferences with clear, with a clear agenda, with very technical issues, uh, which are needed uh, for the UN community to discuss to implement climate action on the ground, uh, and there needs to be a decision to be taken. So that's why you hear uh, all about these uh, negotiations taking place for two weeks somewhere around the world. Um, but is, it is also clear that not everything which needs to be uh, done on climate action um, at the national or regional level can be discussed at a COP and can be decided uh, at the UN level. Um, so you need to um, differ between the UN level and what then actually is being needed uh, as implementation action on the ground. But what the COP also is, uh, in addition, it is a huge platform for the climate community to come together once a year. So it is like a big climate fair uh, where uh, people meet, um, you have exhibitions, you have hundreds of events uh, where um, various stakeholders present their solutions, their ideas, um, share knowledge, um, everything relate, related, of course, to climate action. Um, so as I already said, um, the Paris Agreement as such uh, is a kind of framework treaty and the implementation, of course, then lies with all uh, the member states and the parties. Um, and all decisions being taken at the UN conference um, are consensus decisions. So we do not vote. Um, so each and everybody has the say in, in all the discussions. So that's why the outcomes are always a compromise. Um, but this does not mean that countries can do more at home as for example, the European Union does and, and Austria being member of the European uh, Union uh, as well. So this is what I wanted to say at the beginning uh, because it is important to understand uh, what a COP can do and what it doesn't uh, do because the expectations in the public are often very high uh, and very different to uh, compared what the actual role of a COP is. Um, so 
COP26 uh, took place in November in Glasgow. So what were the expectations, at least from our side, and what were the outcomes? So we had, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, two years of no UN climate meetings um, since December 2019, when we met uh, before in Madrid. Um, so there was there were urgent decisions uh, to be taken and still outstanding to have every rules in place uh, for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, so one major issue uh, was uh, the question of uh, finalizing the so-called Paris rule book. And there were two big uh, issues outstanding, the question of market mechanism, which includes uh, or included the, the international um, emission trading um, rules uh, and the transparency framework, which is more or less uh, the reporting requirements for the Paris Agreement. So what have member states, parties uh, to report on their climate action on a regular basis uh, to the UN, uh, in which format, which data, which information on policy uh, actions and so on, so that it is comparable uh, and that everybody um, knows what to report and that there are no excuses why you don't report, for example, your uh, emission data. Um, this was achieved actually. So we had a decision uh, both on market mechanisms and the transparency framework. And with that, we have now everything in place uh, or every all the whole rule book in place for the actual implementation of the Paris uh, Agreement. So this was this was a good um, good thing to achieve. Uh, a second point uh, expectation for COP26 was raising ambition. Let's let's call it like that. Um, so the system of the Paris Agreement is that you don't have compulsory uh, reduction targets for each and every country, but you have so-called um, uh, national determined contributions. So every country determines from their own side how much they are willing to contribute to uh, the achievement of the goals of the Paris Agreement. And it is clear from all the scientific reports from the IPCC that the current NDCs which are on the table are not enough uh, to reach um, the goals. So that's why um, there was a huge political push uh, from all sides, particularly from the UK COP presidency, uh, to get more ambitious NDCs on the table for Glasgow. Uh, so that's why heads and state of governments uh, came to Glasgow also to bring new commitments and pledges. Um, this, I would say, was partly achieved. So we, we heard new commitments. The EU brought, uh, uh, had a decision already last year um, to come up um, or to, to reduce 55% um, of the EU overall emissions by 2030. Um, the US is now back on board. This was very positive, uh, back on board with the Paris Agreement and also uh, already before Glasgow committed to an NDC. But what we still know is that this is um, still not enough. So we will need to uh, look into uh, clear decisions each and every time how to raise the ambition from there on. Um, further topics uh, for COP26 uh, was the question of climate change adaptation, very important uh, question always for developing countries, particularly from Africa. Uh, and there was a decision on uh, doubling uh, adaptation finance, uh, which was uh, received very positively from, um, from the developing world. And then the whole question of climate finance, uh, particularly support for developing countries, this was a big issue and will remain an ongoing discussion uh, for, for the coming uh, meetings as well. Uh, what we had on the political level, more political level, uh, level was a discussion about phasing out of coal. 
and phasing out of uh, fossil fuel subsidies. Very important uh, question. There, unfortunately, uh, at the very end, uh, we didn't reach consensus, particularly with India and China, to have at least somehow a mentioning um, that everybody is committed to, committed to phasing out um, coal. So we had to change in the last night the wording from facing out to facing down of coal. Um, but we have some, some good uh, decisions on the question of in a phasing out uh, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Of course, from a European perspective, from an Austrian perspective, uh, this should have been much more ambitious decision, but at least um, for the first time ever, we have something on coal and fossil fuel subsidies in COP decisions, which is a good hook to work further in future on these two topics. Um, so overall, um, on the outcomes of COP26, um, it was more than we actually expected when we went to Glasgow. So uh, some lights, but also shadow, uh, because we still need more ambition when it comes to mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. And we have every rules now in place um, for implementation. So no excuses anymore uh, not to focus on implementation now. Um, and this is what I, um, what I want to focus on next, because um, we need climate action from all stakeholders in support of the implementation. This is key. Uh, it is not only governments, um, I mean, no excuses for governments uh, to shift uh, responsibility to stakeholders. This, this is not what I want to say, uh, but governments can only set frameworks. We can, um, we can put in place some regulations, we could in place uh, support schemes, incentives, subsidies, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, it is important uh, that all stakeholders um, contribute to the achievements of the Paris Agreement goals, uh, contribute to climate action, particularly the private sector. Um, so this is uh, this is what um, in the UN process we're trying to do to do with uh, the so-called global climate action agenda, where we have always two um, action champions. Uh, you might know one of them is currently Nigel Topping. Uh, he is CEO of We Mean Business. Um, and they are trying to bring together the UN process and the UN goals with actual um, implementation um, and, and, and action of the private sector. And this then vice versa somehow puts also pressure on the actual negotiations um, because if um, UN negotiators and countries see that a lot of stakeholders are doing already a lot um, and they are asking for more uh, support from governments or they are asking for other regulatory frameworks. Um, this, of course, puts pressure also on the actual UN process. So what comes next? Um, as I said, we still need more ambition. Uh, we need more ambition from all sides. Uh, the next UN Climate COP uh, will take place this year in November. Well, we will see how the pandemic situation is, but the plan is to have it in November in Egypt, because Egypt is going to be the next COP presidency. Uh, we do expect that for, for Egypt, the main focus will be on climate change adaptation and finance. Um, and it will be important, again, that the COP uh, keeps up the, mom the momentum for, for climate action, for um, uh, putting also pressure you know, to do more, to raise the ambition. Uh, the focus will be now, as I already mentioned, on implementation, so national policies, uh, how to support energy transition, how to move to renewables, um, how to enhance innovation, research and development in these areas, technologies, um, to provide incentives and how to involve stakeholders. 
this is all not in detail being discussed at the UN level, but this is what we all need to do uh, when we're talking about uh, national level climate action. So in Austria, we, we, we try to do um, and, and enhance our efforts, at least from our ministry side. Um, we have a new renewable energy law in place. We have um, a climate ticket in place. Uh, we're working on uh, new support schemes for the energy transition, for environmental technology, for research and innovation. And a currently a new climate law is under discussion and hope, hopefully uh, we can uh, submit uh, a draft climate law to uh, parliament soon. With that, I would, I would like to close my introductory remarks. I hope that I was on time and didn't speak too long. Um, but I, uh, I wanted to give you an o a more general overview, but uh, also some of the details uh, of COP26 and what to expect next. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elfie, and thank you also for this very realistic uh, overview with both uh, the shadows and the lights, how you phrased it. And I think the, uh, one of the key messages that you put out here is that uh, all, all stakeholders uh, need to be on deck and I think that's a, it's a really great bridge to our next to, to, or to our panelists as well to bring them on board as well because they are both from the private sector one as mentioned before Salesforce uh, you know for contributing highly already to uh, to their uh, to their own footprint and then uh, of course also Reinhardt with Glacier who helped the transformation um, before we connect really the the topics here I would like to just get a little bit of more of understanding from, from Julie and Reinhardt. So what, what you do, uh, why you do what you do. So Julie, um, again, I mentioned, I mean, Salesforce is basically an IT company. It's a software company. Still, it seems that, that sustainability is such a big topic for you. So why is that? Why is that such a, why, why is that such a big topic? Happy to dive in. Um, thank you so much for having me and uh, such a lovely overview of what happened at COP LP. So thank you. Um, I think at Salesforce, we, the company recognizes that we are in a climate emergency um, and that everyone, whether it's nations, businesses, or individuals, has a really important role to play to ensure that we create a 1.5 degree future. Um, and that's been really core to the company's DNA from the beginning. Um, Salesforce will often say that we believe business can be the platform for change and we really mean it and consider the planet to be a key stakeholder of ours. So yes, we are a software company, but really we're focused on business transformation for our customers who span every industry and every sector. And so when you place that in the context of a climate crisis, there's a lot that we have the potential to do. So for our sustainability program, we're, we're really focused on bringing the full power of Salesforce to create a sustainable future. And we do that through four key areas. So accelerating the world's largest businesses towards net zero, sequestering 100 gigatons of carbon through conserving, restoring, and growing a trillion trees, protecting our oceans, and energizing the ecopreneur revolution. We believe that these kind of four areas will help drive meaningful climate action at scale. And I think that scale piece is what's so critical, right? This is a giant problem and the scale of it is massive. Um, and we need to address that with the urgency it requires. It's kind of the all hands on deck type moment um, where we need all sorts of strategies. It's yes and um, so that we can achieve that climate goal. So. It's core to our DNA and a core responsibility for companies to be playing their part as we um, approach this giant problem. And it's a real opportunity, I think, for Salesforce as a technology company to lend our expertise to address this critical issue. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's, again, I think you mentioned something. Uh, or, or again, I see a good match to, to Reinhardt as well with what they are trying to achieve with Glacier. I mean, we've known each other a little bit longer. We've actually met a few years ago. And back then, you were still very much involved in, in Pioneers and Pioneer Festival. I would say, I dare to say, it's one of the, one of the key pillars of the Austrian uh, startup ecosystem. And, and now you pivoted a little bit, from at least from an outside perspective, uh, focusing fully on on sustainability and green transformation. How come, why, why that, that pivot, why that shift? 
Well, yeah, thanks for, for having me as well. Um, there was no specific moment, to be honest. Um, the, it was more journey in a certain way. Uh, perhaps two situations I can pick and, 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 and tell you about it is uh, I went on a mountaineering exp expedition in, to Kyrgyzstan um, in 2019. So, and we, we, we had the plan to, to uh, made a, make a first ascent uh, and uh, on, a, on a specific mountain we've seen on pictures. Uh, it's quite a remote area. Um, like like there are just a few expeditions have been there in this area. Uh, and, and we stood in front of this huge, uh, mountain uh, north face uh, covered with ice and so on the only problem was it was way too hot it was like uh, it was the beginning of june um, we had a couple of information about the place but what we have experienced there was just like way from anywhere uh, anything we, we heard up front uh, meaning that it was uh, 15 degrees hotter than expected which you can like somehow uh, well uh, think of was uh, too too warm and especially super dangerous for climbers and alpinists. Um, this made me uh, wonder quite a bit because we, we also talked to the people um, in, in, in the neighborhood there. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is super friendly. The Kyrgyz people are super friendly people, but and they're really connected to nature. And uh, they said, well, this is this is what like Earth is changing and they see it in a quite radical way. They are a landlocked country. Um, the climate change is affecting the, them more than other countries, uh, especially the rich ones. And uh, this is kind of like the 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 basis for the ex like their living, um, meaning glaciers, rivers and so on, like the water system and this completely collapses right now, not overnight, but over over years uh, and quite drastically. Um, so there's a one one uh, statistics that 40% uh, of the glaciers will be gone in Kyrgyzstan until 2025 within the time span span of nine years. So official statistic and 50, 40% when you think of that, it, this is like massive. Um, and the second thing was what what uh, struck me uh, quite significantly uh, was my voluntary work uh, for um, the Alpine Association. Um, so I do youth camps. Uh, and the thing was that uh, the, the teenagers and the children, they know, they knew way more than I did about Earth, about uh, like what is happening and so on. I was like, oh, damn, I mean, they are in school. And they, you know, they are not like, um, they can't really do a lot from their from from their position besides of course what they did with uh friends for futures and so on and this was massive and what what the impact they had uh but the thing is it's on us in a certain way and i said okay i mean what what's better to really focus your whole professional life um on on this matter and this is what what made me um uh, to let me to founding a glacier to really commit my professional life um to the grandest challenge we have as a humanity right now yeah thank you i think i think it gives us a bit of a better understanding why both of you do what you do and so from from to connect now to both both of you know the, the introduction as well do, do you both julie right do you follow uh, conferences like the cop 26 do you have specific expectations and and what do you feel? Is is it enough? What's happening right now? Very tricky question, I know. But um, from a Salesforce point of view, uh, we actually were a partner of COP twenty six, um, and so yes, we were following it closely um, and had a large role to play there, um, which was really interesting. And that's something I've been working on for the past year plus. Um, it was my first COP that I've attended, which was such a valuable experience to see how the negotiations operate um, and really eager to, you know, it was interesting. I had studied it in university and kind of the process and we did a mock negotiation and then to see it firsthand was a very, very cool experience. Um, I think, you know, it's, as Alfie was saying, there's only so much that COP can accomplish, right? It's about the implementation, which relies on many other stakeholders to actually execute. Um, so to ask if COP26 achieved enough, was enough, I think, you know, it's a tough question, right? Because it's hard to imagine what enough is. Um, and I think we saw significant progress for sure um, with, you know, the commitments from so many countries, the pledges, the funding commitments, and there could always 
be more and needs to be more, right? And so I think as we approach this next year, it's really, you know, there's some trust that needs to be built as well in seeing these actions come to fruition. Um, but I think for me, COP was so exciting to see, you know, exactly what Elfie was saying, the progress and focusing on adaptation, um, the, the fact that nature was front and center in a way that it hadn't been at COP before. And I think also that increased business presence on the ground is a really interesting and kind of new development. And I think it was an opportunity for companies to come forward, share their commitments, what actions they've taken, and similar to how countries need to demonstrate how they're going to implement their targets, like companies need to do the same thing. Um, and so in that kind of symbiotic relationship, as Alfie was mentioning, with pressure from the private sector, potentially helping to spur the progress of or the importance, perhaps, of the negotiations or not the importance, really, but just, you know, making sure that it is something that's top of mind for more than just governments, right? Like, this is a community issue. And the more people we can bring in and the more people we can learn from, particularly indigenous populations, I think that that's going to be, you know, that that's how we're going to come up with the solutions that we need or execute on the solutions that we already have. Yeah, I think about uh, the COP, you always have to realize what kind of, of, of forum it is. In the end, at its, of it, uh, at its core, it's a political forum. And I was uh, super excited. I was in Madrid. I, to be honest, I wasn't in Glasgow, uh, but I was in Madrid and uh, I was a bit frustrated or like sad to see the outcome what was in Madrid and like actually also what like there was a lot of talking and this, the, the the claim was a uh, tiempo de actuar um, so a time to act uh, and this was far away from it and then I like in the um, in the weeks and the month after, I just realized why this had like occurred and uh, the situation was like it was because in the end it was a, a blocking of several parties and um, quite a quite a tough cop in a certain way. And I, I also realized it might not be on you. Of course, you can say, well, um, do more in the one specific sector. And yes, the, the, the public sector is, is, is crucial and is one of like the key pillars and like the stakeholders of, of the whole discussion. However, in the end, it's about acting and it's about um, one hand commitment. Yes, but, you know, it's uh, pledges. There's also the saying the pledges is the new never and so on. <laughs> and uh, however, I think it's the acting and you don't need a law for acting. Of course, it helps you because it forces you in a certain way. But when it comes to the corporate sector, um, it's rather a matter of understanding the topic and seeing the chances and the opportunities for you. And then you don't need the COP. But of course, the COP could accelerate actually uh, your commitments. I, this is, uh, I assume, um, also for Salesforce, a very important part because they they, they realize the importance of, of acting here. And of course, they realize the business opportunities because in the end, uh, we can tell anything about, yeah, about nature and climate, but businesses won't survive if, if they don't have a thriving business model. And uh, so, yes, it's cool to rely on the COP, uh, but it's better to act um, with and alongside the COP. I, I think you've already we're diving into a few of my next questions, I think. Uh, so when we talk about um, when we talk about acting, let's let's like fully focus on the company and industry perspective. Uh, as I mentioned before, the the webinar series is digital imperative. We say it is unavoidable to to go digital these days, right? That, uh, we, but we did unfortunately, unfortunately, really had this this pressure that we had to go digital in the past two years. Now. You, you said yourself, I mean, for many stakeholders, there's still blockades and challenges, and there's still something that, that stops certain stakeholders, not only countries, also companies, to really start a transformation. Why is that? Aren't we experiencing enough pressure? Do we need, do we need something that, that makes it truly unavoidable? What do you think? It's a question open to all of you. Happy to dive in. Um, I think you know, 
more pressure pressure is good i think pressure is a very important forcing function and i think this past year has you know we've seen a real shift in media and the conversations happening um which has been exciting as a sustainability professional um i think that sustainability could be that next frontier kind of that you're mentioning you know having it i, th I think we're seeing it gain real importance particularly in our conversations with our customers right it's not this like oh you know tell us more it's really like how did you do this we need to do this now we need to do this faster how can you help which is a really exciting conversation to be having um and i think you know the pandemic as well of course highlighted the, how technology can support these kind of global crises that we're facing um so for us at salesforce i think this is this makes sense and we're kind of you know, as I mentioned with sustainability having kind of been core to our company's ethos from the beginning, it's, um, it feels like a really great time to have the conversation just so front and center. And for us, I think we've long embodied this vision of stakeholder capitalism. So a system where corporate purpose is really focused more on this commitment to all stakeholders rather than just shareholders. Um, so it includes shareholders, customers, employees, partners, the communities where we're operating, the planet, society, right? Like it's much broader. And that is much more, it's a conversation that we're seeing across the board more often. Um, so I think that that's a really exciting shift. And so, you know, more pressure is good. I think for me, if we can keep the momentum that we've had in this past year, keep the momentum in terms of like the discussions that are happening and the actions that accompany it, that's kind of the, the ideal scenario. Shall I continue? Yes, yes, please, of course. Um, well, from, from, from a public sector side, uh, maybe just um, some, some reflection on, on that question because I mean, sustainability for for somebody who has been working for more than 20 years in the environmental field is like, is this new? No, we have been talking about this for 20, 30 years. Um, but um, I mean, the, the experience is that, so I started working with the ministry 20 years ago. And at that time, it was like, yes, sustainable development, climate action, environment, environmental technologies. Yes, this is nice. This is something for environmentalists. This is for you. You do this. Um, but this does not, you know, should not impact any other sectors. This is this is something for environmentalists. Um, and, and we always uh, really had to fight and had a lot of uh, challenging discussions with with other stakeholders, with other sectors um, to to, you know, bring the message across that investing in environment is also good for for the economy uh if you you are a company and you are trying to i don't know introduce eco labels or introduce um certification schemes like emas or iso standards or something like that uh this also has economic benefits um so i mean nowadays this is mainstream. Everybody wants to have something like this. Uh, so it's like, oh, OK, now we got the message across, but um, maybe we still need to do more. What can there's sometimes and just currently on on, on the climate front, um, often the discussion, do we need strict regulation? Or do we just leave it to the markets and to the stakeholders for their voluntary uh, measures because they know anyway what to do? I think you need a good mix of both. Yeah, you need regulation so that everybody knows what is um, the framework you're working in, and you need uh, some incentives um, for uh, sustainability. Um, and then you also need still to work uh, to convince stakeholders uh, to invest into sustainability, climate action and environment. Thanks. 
I actually quite like the comparison to digitization uh, and uh, what was, has, has been in the past. Elfie, you mentioned kind of like the, the people who are working in the field since 20 years, 30 years and so on. I think you can also, not sure, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I like that you can, you can see that also in the IT sector, like the geeks in the 80s and the 90s, they were like, okay, those, uh, it's like, I, I remember it from school, but like, okay, you you won't you won't be anything in the in the future because you're like playing with computer games and so on. Actually, there's they are the highest uh, paid people right now in companies, like the, the developers, coders, and so on. And uh, I I see certain similarities that um, every company has, like in, for of a certain size, has an IT department, but the the main component uh, in the company is that uh, you also have for for working uh, nowadays uh, and uh, uh, like in COVID times, you know how to handle the digital stuff you have. So it's not about like okay certain people. Um, so everybody has to have a certain ground knowledge of digitalization, and I see that a similar uh, similarities with with sustainability and climate action that everybody in the in the companies they have like employees they have to have a certain knowledge in this field not necessarily being experts absolutely not but having a feeling what is more eco friendly and climate conscious uh, if you make choices and what not and if you compare it to the IT sector, it's quite similar. You have a ground knowledge and you don't need to be an expert. There are certain people just focusing on that. But in the end, everybody in the company has to have a certain ground knowledge. And uh, yeah, with other companies like Salesforce has a great uh, sustainability department, but people are in a certain way also trained to be more eco-conscious. And I, I also think that's quite your your formula for Glacier, right? To really approach every single employee in a company. Um, so, so now we, I think, established that, first of all, it is, it is the next big thing. Uh, uh, and also, it is valuable for companies to go directions because, as, as Julie also said, some customers uh, already demand it and they already feel the shift. So it's, it's really changed in the last... 20 years from more of an environment, environment, environmentalist kind of uh, thinking to, to something that's also consumer or, consu or customer driven. Um, but how do you start? Like, Reinhard, maybe I'll ask you because you do that probably on a daily basis. How, how, how do you help companies to even start? Well, I would say uh, to start, it's get your basics uh, done in the beginning. So knowing where you are, where you start from, uh, for example, a carbon footprint. Uh, nowadays, it's not uh, rocket science anymore to, to calculate your carbon footprint. Of course, we do have a problem on the data field when it comes to um, scope free and so on. I mean, um, for those of you who know it, it's kind of like uh, downstream and upstream in your in your business field uh, and, and kind of like the whole value chain to, to assess uh, what is the, the carbon, what are the carbon emissions um, from your products, for example, uh, and others. Uh, but it's, it's not that uh, difficult anymore. Um, so you have a certain base for, uh, for, for start to walk. I uh, would we'll definitely say skill, uh, skill your people, educate your people. And as I said, not like, of course, starting with a view, but going into masses. And it's really about a certain ground level, because then you can ultimately really um, uh, have, a, have an impact on the carbon footprint uh, of the company, which lets me to the third point is uh, you absolutely have then have to, to see what um, your business model is and what you're producing and then looking into, okay, how can you um, make the, the next product uh, more uh, carbon friendlier and, and positive, whatever, um, you, whatever you say, there are a couple of terms out there um, than, the, than the last one. So really um, dive deep into the crucial parts of your business. Uh, but this is already kind of like the, the third step. Uh, but, but ultimately, this is also the step you need to do because in the, in the, in the future, um, and you see it already in countries like the UK and so on, and also increasingly um, in Austria under the, the, the government, this government, that uh, it will be more costly uh, not to do it. Julie, what, what, what would you say? What do you, where do you start with your customers? Uh, it's a conversation that we are having more and more frequently. Um, 
we as a company have been on our sustainability transformation journey for more than a decade. Um, so it takes time. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, right? So I think that what Reinhardt was saying of developing a plan and kind of evaluating what is what is your your business uniquely positioned to do is so critical. And there are some very practical things like carbon accounting that you can get started with right away. But for us at Salesforce, we focused on building a climate action plan. And we did that by asking kind of three main questions. What do we do and why are we doing it? How do we do it? So what's our operating model and our value chain? And who do we have the ability to influence? So our employees, customers, society. And these questions helped us form our own climate action plan that we released this year, but has kind of been an internal plan for many years now. And for us, it focuses on six key priorities. Um, so emissions reduction, carbon removal, trillion trees and ecosystem restoration, education and mobilization, innovation, and regulation and policy. So our work kind of falls under these six categories and all relate back to these six categories, which of course are really in, interwoven with one another. Um, but this has allowed us to think through what is, what is our unique superpower that we're bringing to the climate crisis? And this works for any company in any industry, right? We all have different stakeholders that we're working with, different, op different environments that we're operating within. And so by assessing kind of what are you uniquely positioned to do, that's going to bring forth a unique solution that only that company can contribute. Um, and I think as Reinhardt was saying as well, like bringing employees along in that journey is so critical, right? You're mobilizing potentially thousands of individuals for us at Salesforce, that's 60,000 plus employees that are coming along with us and they're all around the world. And the scale changes very quickly when you do that. Um, and I think, you know, we have this climate action plan that we've published, other companies can reference it, utilize it. And that collaboration between companies is also so critical, right? Because we're all trying to solve for this for very similar issues, if not the same issues in some cases. And so by sharing that information with one another, hopefully that can help us speed up the solutions that we already have at our hands and the ability to implement those. Maybe just uh, some couple of points. Um, a lot of lot of good points were already raised by by Julie and Reinhard. Um, I mean, we, we are also working with companies uh, and they're trying, you know, in, in in particular campaigns or trying to convince them or support them with incentives uh, to you know to move to uh, to to become more green. Um, I mean, what the main message we are telling them is, uh, well, going green doesn't always mean that you lose business, but you might also find out that you have new business opportunities. Uh, so don't don't be afraid of uh, going into uh, into that topic. Um, there might be a comparative advantage uh, if you do more in these areas. Um, so don't 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 fear um, of going into such processes and and try to be innovative. Uh, why not uh, trying to be innovative? I mean, if I would say, uh, I mean, you could also say the public sector. If you see it as a company, uh, what are we doing? Uh, and and then you immediately come to the question of public procurement, for example. Uh, we had heavy discussions in Austria about rules and criteria for public procurement um, and how do you convince other ministries that it's not always the cheapest solution which might be the best solution uh, so if you have to buy things or whatever as ministry or if you have to decide which kind of IT solution might be the best for each and everybody which kind of cars would we need uh, for our fleet um, yeah, maybe it's not always the cheapest, um, but but you need to um, you, you need to make the right choices. Right, I, I remember the, the the discussion about the green electricity for the the public institutions in Austria. And this is, I mean, from a from a carbon perspective, this is super crucial uh, to switch to green electricity. But uh, as I as I heard, this was a quite a discussion in the, <laughs> in the background. So, uh, but definitely the right choice. Well, quite a discussion, but also a very small example. Uh, if ministries 
have public events, so not just webinars, you all very often have a catering. So there were a lot of question marks. Oh, why should we not allow to cater orange juice? Well, orange juice is not locally produced in Austria. So it don't, you know, yes, if it's fair trade, but please not something else. Um, so there are really some small issues also to be discussed. Um, I think that was really covered a lot of great points. And I think there's a lot of good advice here. Um, Maybe as a very last point, we're coming to, to our end also time-wise. So we often tend to look over, you know, to especially to the Bay Area, to Silicon Valley, to find new trends, technological developments, uh, to, to see how we can learn from, from Silicon Valley. But especially with green technologies, Austria is, I think, also in the US quite well regarded as a, as a pioneer and a leader in, in green tech and in, in, in sustainable policies as well. So, so what do you three think with all your different perspectives, what can actually the US or the, the, the Valley even itself learn from Austria? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> well, always difficult question um, also, also for us. Um, you're right, uh, Austria has uh, some really good world leaders when it comes to environmental technologies, being it solar, PV, biomass, uh, what you can, can think of. Um, why are they world leaders? Um, one of the, well, there are many reasons because we had really some pioneers who uh, already in the 80s took the risk to go into completely new sectors and say, okay, I I'm trying this, I'm, I'm starting in my, uh, in my little house and try to produce something and see what's happening. So it's really kind of, there was a kind of uh, startup, um, even it, if it was not called startup um, attitude uh, in the 80s. Um, one point, one additional point, we had quite strict environmental regulations uh, in the 80s when it came to emissions, uh, not, not carbon emissions, but, you know, uh, sulfur, other issues, other things. Uh, so this also uh, contributed to a little bit of a pressure to come up with new and innovative technologies. Um, I think, and then this is, again, you need a good mixture of, um, of a stable regulatory framework with incentives and uh, pioneer spirit um, to have world leaders in certain sectors. Um, one point I would say we can learn from the US is we are not good at communication because not even in Austria, many people know that we have world leaders uh, or really uh, very uh, successful companies in the environmental technology uh, area. I think this is what we can learn from the US. Thanks. Me to jump yeah. in. Um, I think there's a lot that we can learn I, for Salesforce in particular, right? We're really excited to learn from our customers in Austria that are doing really interesting things and have been long focused on using, who have long been focused on transforming, transforming and digitizing their businesses. Um, so I think there's a lot that we can learn there. And Elfie, as you mentioned, that kind of pioneering spirit that Austria is bringing, right? That, that ethos is so important in this day and age and I think we need to see more countries bringing that attitude to the table um, the focus that Austria has on mitigation and adaptation is really important and you know I think a thread that we've seen through this conversation is just the importance in bringing along citizens as well right it's just going to be so critical that we bring along everyday people in these conversations because they are all decision makers in whatever role they might have right and we need everyone on board so i think we can bring that pioneering spirit down to the individual level as well which is um is going to be a game changer as we address the climate crisis yeah, i would i would maybe add here a lot of things are said already um perhaps the the general mindset 
which I see quite an interesting in, in Austria when it comes to, I mean, I've seen um, ecological uh, farmer products in regular supermarkets in Austria long before in other countries. Like I was, I was in the valley a couple of, like, I think it, it was 10 years ago, and I was, I was quite surprised about having own supermarkets just uh, for ecological uh, uh, products, where, whereas we have it in Austria, we already had it in, in the regular supermarkets. And this was like, uh, like way more, like increasing over the past years. The second thing is definitely, um, if you look at agriculture, I mean, every fourth um, uh, uh, farm is biological in, in Austria, which is uh, crazy if you, if you think about it. And this is what I mean with the mindset. If you go into the timber industry, uh, forests and so on, this is like uh, very like tightly aligned with nature in so many cases, not in all of them, uh, but in, in, in so many cases. But then if you look at, so I, I read a book of John Muir, I'm not sure if you know him, like this, this national, uh, well, nature pioneer, uh, one of the co-founders of, of the Yosemite uh, National Park. And uh, there are so many similarities still in the, in the mindset from past, uh, like 100 and 150 years ago. Uh, and if you look at the national parks in Austria and certain, certain streams um, uh, coming, coming together, I think uh, the general mindset is something which is very important in Austria, and this also led in a certain way to a green uh, party in the government, which is in a certain way unthinkable in the US, as far as I know. <laughs> uh, there is a green party, but it's not like that big, and I'm not saying that it will stay there for forever, but just the fact is quite surprising and one of, uh, again, uh, led us to, to certain pioneering uh, regulations and laws. So, uh, well, there's more to come, I hope. Yeah, I think that was a great uh, conclusion of our of our webinar discussion today to conclude in a positive way. Um, and I, I think with my last with my last few minutes, I just would like to thank our speakers, the panelists that you were with us today and and continued this really, really interesting conversation. And I would like to finish with Alfie's words pretty much that we need all stakeholders on board and there are really no excuses for more ambition and there's always more ambition needed in our in our joint initiatives uh, towards a better future. And uh, so thank you so much, everyone. And I would like to will invite everyone who is listening to our next episode on the 27th of January on the transformation of education within the Digital Imperative Series, again with Salesforce. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, bye. Thank you, bye. Thanks.